Um, and uh, always remember this meeting is being recorded and uh, we're happy to uh, share the recording with you both afterwards. It is uh, my great pleasure to uh, welcome everyone today for Conversations with Great Performers. Uh, we're so delighted to have Karen Allen and Diane Perlman here today. Uh, Renee Rota will be introducing them. And of course, we have so much love for Renee who has brought this amazing series together, highlighting uh, the incredible talent here in the Berkshires as well as around the world. I, our last guest will be uh, Zooming to, with us from Germany, I believe. Isn't that right? Actually, uh, Stefan Denev, conductor Stefan Denev, will be uh, Zooming from Sweden. Uh, oh, Sweden, he's, okay. He's looking very forward to saying hello to everybody. He misses the Berkshires very much. Oh, that's so nice. So I'm going to um, turn it over to Renee. And um, we're going to have a wonderful conversation. And just a reminder that if you have questions or comments for Karen or Diane, uh, you can put them in chat at any time. And then at the end of the conversation, we'll have a Q&A period and uh, continue to discuss um, Karen and Diane's work and career and uh, all kinds of great things. So thank you all. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me for From the Podium, Conversations with Great Performers. Today, we are really honored to have a very special guest. Film and theater actor and director Karen Allen may best be known for her portrayal as Marion Ravenwood in Raiders of the Lost Ark or Katie in Animal House, but she has been in over 50 films. In 2017, she made her debut as a director in A Tree, A Rock, A Cloud. This was based upon a short story by Carson McCullers and produced by, Ann Perlman, by Diane Perlman, who we will meet a little bit later. Uh, in addition to Karen's career in film, theater, and more, she's also a successful business owner, and her store, Karen Allen Fiber Arts, celebrates unique clothing from all over the world and includes her own line of cashmere. And it's located in Great Barrington, not far from where Karen resides. Just as her fabrics have many layers, textures, and colors, so too does my guest. Please join me as we welcome film and theater actor and director Karen Allen to Conversations with Great Performers. Good morning, Karen. Good morning. It's lovely to see you. Are we finding you in Great Barrington? Well, I, you're finding me at my house, which is I, not far from Great Barrington. Yeah, I live in another little town not far away. And what brought you to the Berkshires originally? I came up here for the first time the summer of 1981 to do uh, Two for the Seesaw at the Berkshire Theater Festival. They were doing a 25-year a, a anniversary of the play directed by Arthur Penn with um, Anne Bancroft. And um, uh, they were, they were going to, you know, do it again. And they asked me to play uh, the role of Gittle in the, in the play. So um, I came here. I stayed for two months. I stayed at the Red Lion Inn, which is where they put everybody up at the time. And I was very enchanted by the place. Uh, I, I, I really fell in love with it during that two-month period. It's hard not to fall in love with the Berkshires, that's for sure. That's true. You know, in reading about your life, I was really uh, surprised to learn that you were born in a small town in Carrollton, Illinois. I confess that I couldn't even find Carrollton on the map. There are uh, less than 2,500 people there in 2019, and I was really uh, delighted to learn that your father was an FBI agent, your mother a university professor. What do you remember for, from those early days? Well, I, I didn't live in Carrollton. I, I, lived, I think I left when I was about six or seven months old. Oh, However, okay. my mom and dad were both from other small towns very close to Carrollton. They grew mm -hmm. up in those towns. And they, uh, we came back every summer. So, so I came back there to visit with my grandparents every summer. So I got to know that part of the country very, very well. And they were very tiny towns. Carrollton was a big town in comparison to the two towns my mom and dad grew up in. So, um, uh, 
you know, it was, it was I, I loved it growing up. I, you know, we moved around a lot because my dad was in the FBI. My mom was was a, a, a elementary school teacher, not a, oh. not a university. Oh, teacher. okay. She dropped her first and second grade, but um, uh, you know, we we then proceeded to live all. Or, you know, we lived in Tennessee, we lived in uh, Pennsylvania, we lived in New Jersey, and then we ended up in Washington D.C. when I was ten, and and my dad had the rest of his career there. I, I was really interested to learn that you also attended the uh, design and uh, the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. Yeah, I went there when I was 17 because I had become interested in textiles and design really as a, as a child. I was, you know, maybe four, five, six years old when I started having a real interest in, in textiles and design. And, and, um, so uh, yeah, I went there at 17. It was just a two year school at that time. Now it's a, actually you can get a master's there. So I guess it's a six year school now. But uh, yeah, it was, it was a very, very interesting time in my life. Um, uh, it was also right in the middle of the ferment of the 60s. So, so there was a lot going on in, in the world and it was a very interesting time to be in New York City. And uh, uh, but my, you know, I, my life went in a different direction not long afterwards. However, it's continued, you know, I've continued to work in this arena as well, so. I understand you did a, a lot of traveling at that time. You were, were touring through uh, South and Central Asia. Um, you must have had a very adventurous uh, trip because uh, from what I read, you, you toured and then came back and settled in Washington, D.C. Yeah, actually, it was Central and South, uh, uh, South America. So I, oh, I South left. America. Went to the, I went to the West Indies, and I lived in the West Indies for about six months. And then I started this journey with two friends, where we drove from Mexico City to Southern Peru, and we took about nine or ten months to do it. And it was fascinating. And uh, you can't do it all by road. In Panama, you have to put your car on a ship. And there was a border war between Colombia and Panama at the time, so we had to go by way of an island called San Andreas, which was, we had to go back north and wait for a month there to get our car on a ship going into Colombia. So it was, it was a fascinating trip. Uh, and, and I was very, I was maybe 21 or 22 at the time. And so it was, you know, at a very developmental stage of my life, so. Seems like it was excellent preparation for your roles in, in the Indiana Jones films. I guess it was. It was good preparation for just life, I think. You know, to be, to be out in the world, in, in a very different world than the one you've grown up in, is, is uh, at that age when you're learning so much about yourself and trying, in a sense, to uh, shake up that sort of sense of identity, I think, that we all in some ways kind of oppressively, oppressively get put on us, you know, growing up. Everybody's always trying to tell you who you are, you know. <laughs> and it's good to have no one telling you who you are and just figuring it out as you go. Absolutely, absolutely. So I was reading that you were in Washington, D.C. and uh, saw a production on, of a Polish theater company. And you uh, went in one person and came out another person. What about that experience that changed you? You know, I, I had had very little exposure to theater. I grew up <laughs> loving films. Um, you know, I, I watched as a kid, you know, an adolescent and young adult, like so many films uh, from the 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, and then grew up into an amazing period in, 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 in films in the 60s. Um, but I also had gotten very interested in foreign films as well. And, and um, this theater, I, but I just, I, I wasn't not that theater aware, never had heard of this theater company. It turned out they were really one of the most celebrated theater companies in the world, uh, in the experimental world at least. Um, and they were just extraordinary. He called, uh, the director's name was Jerzy Grotowski, and he called his actors acrobats of the soul. And he, they trained, you know, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. They were extraordinary. They could do anything. And they spoke completely in Polish. I didn't understand a word that was said. But I was so profoundly moved by what I saw 
that when I left, I turned to the friend who had brought me was the director of a theater company in Washington, D.C., and had been in Poland with this company for many years, studying with them and working with them. And I said, do you ever train actors? Do you, I, I just, whatever that was, I want, I want to, I want to explore it. And um, within two weeks, I was a student with their company. So uh, it just, you know, it was, it was, you know, you have those moments in life where it's almost like the top of your head comes off, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, and you just suddenly see everything through a different lens. And I think that's very much what happened to me. You know, I very much understand uh, how you felt because in my early years going to the Metropolitan Opera, way before subtitles, uh, watching operas and languages that I didn't know, and I was immersed in the action on stage and the singing on stage. And uh, uh, I, I completely understand. And by the way, for our viewers, viewers, if you hear that bell going off, that's definitely Steven Spielberg trying to reach Karen for another film. So, you know, he'll just have to wait because we're busy. <laughs> so moving on, you were struck by the bug, I think. And I you moved you moved to New York. You studied at the Lee Strasberg Theater that produced uh, people such as Sally Field and Alec Baldwin, uh, some amazing artists. And um, uh, what was that like, studying in New York? Well, I, I came, to, I, I stayed with this company for about four years and, and did quite a few plays with them. And then when I moved to New York, I felt like I had had such a unusual training working with this particular experimental theater company that it, it felt like it would be a smart thing to really understand to have a, a sense of common language because the way I had been trained was very very specific so I went I studied at the Stella Adler Institute and I went to the Lee Strasberg Institute just really to understand how other actors were being trained and to have a, a little bit of a clearer sense of, of different, dif different methodologies. Um, and it was fascinating. I, I loved it and I learned so much, uh, but I didn't, I wasn't able to stay that long because literally within four or five months I was cast in my first film. So uh, that sort of broke uh, my, my focus on on studying and suddenly you know i was studying in front of a camera which is not not i wouldn't necessarily recommend that but but it's you know it's that's a steep learning curve but fortunately i was with a group of actors who were all in the same boat as i was many of them had never done a film before so uh we all had for the most part theater backgrounds and we were all learning together which made it a lot of fun and that first film was Animal House, which was an incredible blockbuster. And uh, you have a great story to tell as to how that came about. How I got cast in Animal House? Uh -huh. Well, it was, it was one of those, like, you know, I always think that, you know, what we think of as luck or as uh, opportunity, you know, it's, it's just these sort of little moments of awareness where you notice something and you're just there. But I was literally walking out of the Strasbourg Institute one day and I glanced up at a bulletin board that was right by the outer door. And there was a little three by five card that said feature film casting college age actors and actresses. I was a little older than college. I was maybe 25 or 26, but I looked young and, and I just wrote down the address, popped a picture and resume in, in the mail, didn't really think anything of it other than, you know, why not? Um, and a day or two later, I got a telephone call and they wanted me to come to Universal Studios in, in New York, um, which was on I think Park Avenue at the time. And I showed up and I walked in and the casting director said, I know you're not in the union. I know you don't have an agent, but you're my girl. And there was just something in my photographs. I, I, I didn't know anything about putting together a, a resume or a photographs because I just never, I'd only worked with this theater company and I really didn't know anything about working in the commercial world of acting. So I, I had a, a a photograph that was four photographs from four plays I had done. And then my resume was all theater, but she was not daunted by that. She, she just felt that I looked 
however she saw Katie when she read the script, she just thought I was Katie. So, um, you know, sometimes that ha that's how, you know, casting can go in, in film. People are, in a sense, they're waiting for the person that they have in their mind to walk in the door. And somehow that happened in terms of Animal House. Well, I've always felt that luck is where opportunity meets preparation. And what a wonderful uh, opportunity that was for you. It seems like you had a lot of fun doing Animal House. I watched it the other night. Oh, you did. <laughs> we did have fun. It is so politically incorrect at this point in time, but um, it's still it's still a very very wonderful and very funny film. Um, yeah, we did. It was a great group of people that I got to work with. All of them, uh, you know, I have very special relationship with. We're still very close friends. We get together from time to time. Some of them I see quite often. Some who live in Los Angeles, not quite as much, but uh, uh, yeah, it was, we had, we had a blast. And then, you know, the, the, the cherry on that particular, you know, whipped cream was that it was such a huge success, which I don't think any of us were prepared for, or, you know, I certainly had no, I mean, I, not only had I never done a film before, I had never, when I started shooting Animal House, I had never met a person who had ever been in a film. I didn't know any, I'd never been on a film set. I knew absolutely nothing about working in film. So it was quite, you know, uh, extraordinary experience to be in a film that was suddenly, you know, so successful and so uh, got so much attention. Well, your career skyrocketed with Raiders of the Lost Ark. So tell us how that came about. Well, Spielberg was friends with John Landis, who directed Animal House. And he was also friends with a, a director named Rob Cohen, who had directed me in his very first feature film um, that was called A Small Circle of Friends that we shot at Harvard in Boston. Uh, mm -hmm. Not long before uh, Spielberg was going to direct Raiders of the Lost Ark. So he had spoken to both of those directors about me and, and they said, oh yeah, you know, you should meet Karen for sure. And he came to New York and we just met in an office and chatted briefly. And then he decided he wanted me to screen test for Marion Ravenwood. And I was never allowed to read the script. I was just given the scene in the bar when we first meet her, she's drinking the you know people uh, under the table and 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 betting on who's going to pass out first and and then the scene where Indiana Jones comes in and and Harrison had not been cast Tom Selleck had been cast in the role but he had to step down from the role because um, uh, his television show Magnum PI had been picked up and and they wouldn't let him out of his contract so I auditioned with. Uh, John Shea, a wonderful New York actor, and with uh, Tim Matheson, who I had been in Animal House with. Um, we, we did screen tests together. And um, when I was cast to play Marion, there was still no Indy. They couldn't find anybody to play Indy. And I think they were reluctant to cast Harrison because he was in the Star Wars. He was also playing Han Solo. And somehow to, to carry the mantle of both of those roles seemed, you know, perhaps daunting to them, but uh, anyway, uh, it all worked out. <laughs> Harry, Harry did. got cast in the end and, and uh, you know, he, he's so wonderful in the, in the role. I understand actually that your role was originally planned for Amy Irving, who was Steven Spielberg's girlfriend at the time. Uh, so I wonder, how did, did never you relate heard that. to Oh, well. Um, I didn't know that, yeah. Uh, it's possible. Uh, you'll have to ask him. But uh, uh, I was wondering, did you relate to the role of Marion Ravenwood? Oh, instantly. I mean, you know, instantly I fell in love with the role just from reading the one scene. Um, I thought, you know, I mean, you're meeting a woman who's living in a bar in Nepal. Her, her father has vanished. She's, uh, you know, found a way to, to make some money by, you know, having this incredible ability to uh, drink, you know, big mountain men under the table. And, uh, you know, she just seems very, very uh, clear and uh, 
strong and you know when he walks in and and sort of is is trying to be very uh you know casual you know she just clocks him one on the chin because he's broken her heart 10 years earlier when she was obviously just a a young girl and uh you know i i i really i i i just fell in love with the character i thought i've rarely you know seen or read such a great introduction to a character ever um so I, you know, I very much wanted to do the film from the first time I read that scene. I thought, you know, this is, this is something that could be really, really interesting. You know, many people wonder what the rehearsal process is when you are uh, needing to be intimate with someone or a screen kiss. Can you tell us what is involved in something like that? Well, I suppose, you know, it, dep it depends on the director. It depends on how intimate we're talking about. Um, you know, sometimes you have very closed sets if it's a very intimate scene where very few people, uh, you know, are allowed to be on the set, both for the rehearsal and while you're shooting the, the, the film. Um, I'm just thinking about kissing someone who you never kissed before. Yeah, you know, you just have to dive in and do it. I mean, you know, it's, 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 you know, you know, I mean, I think you can be a little nervous about it. I, I certainly have been. Um, you know, you, you, I, I think smart directors generally try to save those scenes for at least the middle or the end of the film so that it's not day one, <laughs> you're having to kiss somebody you've maybe just met the day before or uh, in some, uh, sometimes like that morning. Um, so, so that you have developed a relationship with the person and you've gotten to know them. And I think actors tend to you know, move towards each other, not only as, as the people we are, but in relation to the characters that we're playing. So if you're playing someone that you love or playing someone that you're very close to, you tend to really try to open and get to know that person. And you, you make a special effort to create some, some uh, uh, you know, closeness with that actor so that those moments when they come are not awkward because when it's awkward, it, it, it doesn't work on film. You have, to, you have to reshoot it or you have to cut it out of the film or, you know, if, 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 if you're trying to create. Well, we have a little bit of a frozen screen. I'm sure we will unfreeze it. Uh, this is just such a, a wonderful uh, conversation. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. And uh, we'll try to unfreeze Karen. Uh, She's frozen there in time. It's, it's uh, <laughs> Andrew, we're having uh, a challenge on freezing Karen. There you are. Um, she should, uh, oh, she just needs to restart. That usually fixes it. And right now, I just want to remind everyone listening uh, to post your questions and comments for Karen in the chat box below. Um, it's located uh, right underneath. And uh, we can also um, segue to showing the, uh, the short uh, video if you want to do that. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. Uh, we're, you know, Karen had her directorial debut uh, with a tree, a rock, and a cloud. Uh, um, and uh, I wonder perhaps if we might introduce Diane Perlman. Uh, who can uh, tell you more a little bit about this. But before we even uh, see the trailer, let me tell you a bit about Diane Perlman, uh, who is an independent entertainment producer, a studio executive, and businesswoman with 30 years of experience in media creation and production. Her specialty is digital film production, animation, and feature film visual effects. Diane is the executive director of the Berkshire Film and Media Collaborative, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting film and media production in the Berkshires. She also produced the award-winning short film, A Tree, A Rock, and A Cloud, written and directed by Karen Allen. Among many other films, she's worked on The Matrix, which won an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects in 2000. She has collaborated with director Scott Morris in producing the award-winning behind-the-scenes documentary, The Making of Luxor. 
Diane Perlman holds a degree from Vassar College and resides right here in the Berkshires. Welcome, Diane, to Conversations with Great Performers. Hi, Renee. Lovely to be here. Thank you. I just texted Karen, and apparently she's lost electricity at her house. Wow. So, um, uh, I'm, I'm texting her on my phone, and hopefully she'll be able to rejoin us, or nice. else I'll just try and pick up the slack. Well, I hope that, that she will. I know you've worked with her uh, very closely on uh, a number of projects. And uh, today we're going to focus on her directorial debut. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how this came about? Sure. Um, so A Tree or Rock a Cloud is a short story by um, the acclaimed author Carson McCullers, who's probably best known for The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, um, which was made into a film. And Karen always loved the short story, A Tree, A Rock, A Cloud. She told me that um, uh, since she was about 22, if you stayed at her apartment, she would read it to you before you went to bed, which I thought was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, and she always had an affinity for it. And people, uh, once she directed in the theater, people then asked her to direct um, films. And she was a little hesitant to direct a full feature. So she started with this short. And um, her um, colleague at the time, Brian Long, came on to produce. Um, and then she is on the advisory board of Berkshire Film and Media Collaborative, the nonprofit that I run here. And she asked uh, if I would join because Berkshire Film and Media really helps productions when they come here to the Berkshire. So because I had run Mass Illusion, the um, studio here, I knew all the crew here. So I came on board and uh, it was a very small film with a very small budget. We shot it uh, at the Silverbrook, Old Silverbrook Cafe in Santa's Field. Uh, the story is a lovely story between um, a young boy like delivering newspapers and a man who's traveling through town who sort of gives him wisdom about life and love. It's really wonderful. And we needed to find a um, sort of a small diner that also had a bar in it, which the Silverbrook did. And I was like, great, we can use this. And then Karen's best friend, Christy Zia, who is an Academy Award winning uh, or nominated production designer came in and said, we can't use any of it. But anyway, the, the bones of it were there. And um, if you go to the website, A Tree or Rock a Cloud, the film you can see be before and after pictures, which are uh, pretty amazing. And um, yeah, Karen and I did everything on it. We did the casting. We, uh, of course, put the crew together, uh, shot it here in Santa's Field for uh, six days, um, and then uh, finished it. I was the post-production supervisor as well, uh, oversaw the editing, and um, yeah, we just actually are thrilled. We uh, took it on the road to festivals around the world. We took it to Cannes. Uh, we won at a couple of festivals. Karen won a directing award, and um, uh, we're now looking to distribute it. We just signed with Canopy to do educational distribution and we're looking to just, you know, stream it on Netflix or something like that. So but let's take a look at, at the trailer and uh, there's so much more to, to discuss. Uh, uh, Diane is really the go-to person here for a film in the Berkshires and there's so much uh, to talk about. Would you like to set up this particular uh, trailer? It, first of all, does the, the, does the bar still exist? Uh, it's there. The Silverbrook Cafe has uh, uh, had many iterations, as far as I understand it. Um, it was, I believe, a creamery, or a, at one point, uh, it was a um, it it was a kind of a biker bar. At one point, uh, had music. Uh, when uh, it had been closed, when we found it, it was sort of a diner grocery store. So. Um, we took it over. The uh, movie takes place in 1947. Karen made a directorial decision to shoot the film in black and white. And um, so uh, we used a, a local cinematographer, Richard Sands, Rick Sands, who lives in Pittsfield. Uh, he's a lighting genius. Uh, he works with the uh, photographer Gregory Crutzen to light his uh, still shots. And I'd worked with Rick for 25 years. So. Um, this is a trailer uh, that was cut by a friend of mine in Boston who was an award-winning editor, and it just sort of sets up the feel of the film. So let me know when you would like to run it. Let's take a look. Okay.
look very carefully. Have you ever seen her before? Not so I know of. It was my wife. Dad? No. I will explain. You think you can put up a kind of shield, but remembering, don't come at a man face forward. It corners around sideways. I was at the mercy of everything I saw and heard. I'm not explaining this right. What happened? She was my wife for one year, nine months, three days, and two nights. I loved her. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm especially drawn to the composer uh, of, of the film. Just very hauntingly beautiful music. Hold on one sec, sorry. Uh, yes, the composer is local. A gentleman named Mark Kelso did the music for us. Um, there are a couple of local actors in there, Cale Brown and Terry Holland. Uh, the young boy, uh, Jackson Smith. Uh, we uh, put out an open casting call. We received 350 resume, uh, 150 resumes for the boy. Uh, we saw 50 young men who came from North Carolina all the way from Boston. And uh, we ended up casting Jackson, who lives in Housatonic. Uh, he had never done a film before. And what Karen um, really loved about Jackson is that he really could listen to Jeff DeMunn, the actor. And we had a lot of young boys who were acting, listening, you know, really working at it. And Jackson just had this wonderful, innocent uh, appeal about him. So uh, it was terrific. And, um, you know, Karen is looking at what she wants to possibly direct next. So it was right. really an exciting project. And it was very much a Berkshire project. A um, mm -hmm. lot of local crew. Um, we use local caterers. It's why we really encourage production here in the Berkshires, because it brings money into our local economy at a time when, you know, it might not be the high summer season in, in a normal situation. Well, we're very thrilled that you make your home in the Berkshires and uh, the Berkshire Film and Media Collaborative has done so much to help uh, many filmmakers and certainly uh, boost our economy. And uh, you told me somewhat in confidence about a brand new project that you're going to be working on. Would you share that with us? Which one? <laughs> okay. Which one? That's right. Well, there um, right. you know, yeah. uh, I will just uh, precede this by uh, mentioning that, of course, the Berkshires is known for great music at Tanglewood and great theater at Shakespeare and Company and Barrington Stage and, and all the wonderful theater that we have and fabulous dance at Jacob's Pillow. But we seem to be missing one element. Oh, and of course, the arts, the arts at the Sterling Clark and the Mountain, you know, but we're missing film. Right. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Of course. I thought you were talking about the film project, but we can talk about that next. Um, yes, yeah, so about a year ago, um, Tina Packer approached me. Um, we have looked at building a film studio here um, for many, many years. Um, and uh, Shakespeare and Company, as many people may know, put out an RFP for organizations to come in and possibly do something on their um, at their location and we applied with the idea to uh, basically construct a film education center here in the Berkshires and our proposal was submitted in January and accepted in March. Uh, the title of the project is Kemble Street Studio after the actress Kem uh, Fanny Kemble and it's on Kemble Street and uh, we're really thrilled. It will be a full production and post-production facility an international based facility. So the, I, the mission of it is to really go back and teach the craft of filmmaking. Uh, we are in um, uh, Kent Jones, who's on a dear friend on my advisory board who headed up the New York Film Festival and won for his uh, feature film tri at Tribeca called Diane, but not about me. Uh, is very excited because what he said is in looking at thousands of films for the New York Film Festival in the digital age, age we're losing the craft of filmmaking. 
and the lighting and really some amazing uh, techniques. So um, this will really be a place to teach the craft and also responsible media messaging that we feel is incredibly important in this day and age, social media, branding, all those things. So it will be a resource for Western Massachusetts. Uh, we will bring in uh, international directors um, because we have connections to those to come in and teach. And um, it will really be for our schools, but also to seek out the best and brightest filmmakers around the world to come here and make films. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it won't be a huge studio uh, because of my background in uh, visual effects and also working with a gentleman, Paula Combe, who we both worked with Doug Trumbull. Uh, it's really gonna be a virtual stage. So it'll be green screen, but in this day and age, uh, especially right now, uh, all the big movies aren't shooting. Insurance companies will not cover because of COVID. And so the idea of taking small crews out and shooting location stills and then bringing those stills and wrapping them on a stage and just putting a couple actors is much more safe and secure. So it really will be a, a studio of the future. So we're very excited about that. Well, this is very exciting for the Berkshires indeed. And if any of our viewers would like to know more, uh, we're happy to provide uh, uh, Diane Perlman's information. This is uh, a great opportunity for you to get in on the ground floor, so to speak. And uh, Diane, we're very thrilled that you um, will be doing something like this in the Berkshires. Uh, yet another reason to, to visit our wonderful area. But, you know, going back to what you said, uh, I understand there was a, a film just recently uh, being shot entirely in the Berkshires called I'm Not Him. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the challenges of producing a film and directing a film in the Berkshires during COVID time? Absolutely. So um, a lot of films come to Massachusetts because we have a very lucrative tax incentive program here. If you, your budget is over $50,000, uh, and you shoot over 50% of it here, you can apply for 25% back as a tax credit. So when that was passed in 2005, um, movies started coming here. And by 2008, I think it was about 140 million had been spent in the state. And we said, wait, we have the Berkshires, we're so beautiful. So that's why basically Berkshire Film and Media happened. And we've had films here, some large films, you know, Daddy's Home 2 was here in Great Barrington. <laughs> Um, for a while, and um, you know, they Bunker just Hall also was yeah. it Bunford Hall Bunker was Hall. featured in uh... yes, Bedford Hall is is actually in the poster, uh, yeah, for, for the movie. So, um, uh, yeah, there's there's been a lot of filming here, but I think, um, right now the industry is at a standstill. Um, the studios really want to get back up and running, but you know, when you have 80 or 100 people on set. There's a lot of talk between the unions, how are people safe, people are very concerned, actors don't want to go back on set unless the insurance covers them. But the smaller independent productions are much more flexible, have much smaller crews and cast, and are looking to Western Mass to come shoot. So uh, yes, I'm not him. Uh, the producer was um, Ellen Vanderweiden, who was my line producer on Karen's film. She's been here with a couple of films, and um, the director just loved the Berkshires. So um, it, was a, it was a low budget feature film. He used many, many local people and was here for three weeks. They just wrapped uh, filming on Friday. There's a documentary shooting here. Uh, I believe it's gonna be for Netflix for a one day shoot right now. Um, there's a lot of smaller productions. Our nonprofits are, are starting to film because they need to reach their communities and still raise money. So I'm working with filmmakers to put galas online uh, organizations don't realize when you put your gala online, it's really making an hour video is really what you're doing. Uh, so our film, our local filmmakers are incredibly busy, but they're shooting with smaller crews. They're sh right now, um, Ben Hillman is shooting for Fairview Hospital. The crew has four people on it and they're masked and we are following um, the guidelines set out by the Massachusetts Film Office. Uh, so that means there's no craft service table anymore. Um, lunches are served in bags, there's distancing, everyone wears masks except for the actors when they're on set. Uh, so there's very strict guidelines, but we are working with the film office and they're extremely happy that the production is still happening here. 
Uh, I was very excited to see that Ben Brantley on the very front page of the art section of the New York Times showcased our production of Godspell here in the Berkshires. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly thankful that our community is resilient and creative in ways that I had no idea uh, a community could be. Uh, going and into the Shakespeare and Company parking lot to see uh, the collaboration between the Berkshire International Film Festival and our drive-in theaters. Yes. So uh, this is a, a really wonderful community. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, you know, you are an award-winning uh, filmmaker. How did you get started in the business? You went to Vassar. When I went to Vassar, there wasn't a film department. Um, I knew I wanted to be in the arts. My friends all went into banking. I went and worked for a Broadway producer who sat on his couch and smoked cigars and I did everything else. And um, then I went into advertising and I sort of got, I thought production would be interesting. And they said, well, you can be a secretary in the production department for eight years. And I was like, no, not really. And then someone I um, grew up with, because I also grew up as a, um, in an amateur dance company, I actually spent a summer at the Pillow when I was 16, when it was much funkier than it is now. Um, but uh, this woman, Alison Brown, called me and said, oh, did you dance with my sister? She happened to work at the same ad agency, and she heard about a job at a trailer company. So I went and was the third person at a trailer company in New York that became the foremost trailer company. It was when studios were still in New York, Paramount and Orion and Vestron, which are two companies that don't even exist anymore. And I went back to um, NYU for film production classes and, um, and uh, you know, learned how to cut film. Yes, we were still working in film and you know, cut my fingertips, which at a trailer company, it's all editors. So they loved that I was in you know getting uh, trained and then after that work uh, went to work for a company called our Greenberg Associates I got plucked out of uh, Tony Silver Films to work for Bob and Richard Greenberg which was at the time the only visual effects company in New York uh, and um, uh, I remember interviewing with Bob and he showed me some black and white animation on the steam deck which is a flat where we used to cut film and he showed me some animation and uh, I, I left the interview crying because I had no idea how the animation got on the film. And I ran to Coliseum Books and um, bought, um, George Lucas has just, had just come out with a, a book on industrial light and magic. And I ran home and read the whole thing and got the job and basically uh, was trained in visual effects at that company. And so um, what, what, what do you think the industry uh, uh, is like for women these days? So many changes. In, in our world, uh, certainly, um, you know, does it affect the industry? And are there more film uh, opportunities for women as producers and directors and uh, behind the scenes more than just actors? Um, you know, I, I, oops, we lost Renee. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I, to answer the question, I think, um, oh, there's Megan, hi. Um, when I entered the business, especially in visual effects, I was usually the only woman on set, especially on the on Eraser, which was an Arnold Schwarzenegger film. There were 104 people on set and, you know, and on Warner Brothers, and there was one woman and myself. Uh, so especially in some of the technical uh, parts of the business, I think women are making inroads. Uh, we're starting to see more camera women. Uh, we're starting to see more directors. We're starting to see more uh, diversity in terms of directors, women, and people of color, which I think is good. But um, we haven't made the inroads that we want to. But I think that Hollywood, there are production companies that are um, that are signing statements saying that they will use more women and and uh, diversify their crews and their directors and producers on productions. And I think that that's really important. Great. So um, I have noticed this week that anything that can go wrong, wrong does go wrong with computers. I don't know if other people have noticed this. I, I like to look for those universal kind of trends. <laughs> that makes me feel better. Um, but I was wondering if um, I, I know, Diane, you also have a behind the scenes video about the making of a tree, a walk, a cloud, if I got this right. A tree, um, a walk, a cloud. <laughs> And I thought that'd be wonderful to show. Is is that possible? And um, while 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 we're watching the behind the scenes little mini doc, um, you can also check in with Karen and see how her electricity is doing. I just did. 
I and I sent you some information about the possibility of her calling in if she has a. I, uh, you know, I will send that to her so she can call in on her phone. I'm just glancing something about power lines and a chainsaw. So I'm not sure, but I'll. <laughs> okay. Well, why don't we put on that video and, and then um, we can get try and get an update from Karen. Okay, that great. Good? Well, That's I'm why we call it the Berserk Shears. Right? <laughs> yes, right. We're ready. We're ready. So, um, okay. Uh, just a little bit about the behind the scenes. We were fortunate there is a gentleman who lives in the Berkshires, Tony Dunn, who is um, uh, also an executive producer at WGBY in Springfield and a filmmaker. And he made this terrific behind the scenes for us. So uh, you'll get a little um, taste of what it was like to be with us. Hold on one second and I'll, uh, I'll share it with you. Oh my gosh, can we get Karen back? Uh, I will try. While we're watching this, I'll, I'll ask her to sign in on our phone. Action! This is my first time stepping behind the camera as a director, so, you know, it seems to me if you're going to jump into a new challenge, you might as well do it with something that you feel passionate about. And the Carson McCullers story, uh, Tree Rock a Cloud, was a, a story that she had been fascinated with for forever. To me, it's sort of a perfect story. It's a beautiful sort of zen-like story about the passing of wisdom between a, an older man and a young boy. and who happened to meet by chance one morning in this cafe. You have three main characters, all three males, all three at very different ages uh, in their life. And I think it's, it's, it's such an interesting story to see how the three of them interact. Uh, so I play Leo and he is the manager or maybe the owner of the cafe that the, the young boy wanders into. And uh, Leo's kind of a grumpy, bitter guy, and he takes some enjoyment in giving the, the man, the transient, that uh, Jeff plays, a uh, hard time. I play uh, an old man who has gone through a, a bit of a life-changing experience. He's kind of quiet, and then he opens himself up, and then he leaves kind of mysterious. And in the process of the tale, he attempts to pass on what he has learned from this experience to a a 12-year-old boy. And he doesn't really feel uh, like he can tell the story to that many people, but that he comes up to this boy and he tells it to him. I thought it was very intriguing. Now, I began to think of wanting to do a film of it. And I, I drove by this place not far from my home. It's in a town called Sandusfield, Massachusetts, called the Silverbrook Cafe. And I just kept getting this little hit, you know, that this was the place where I should shoot this film. And one day I was sitting with Brian Long and I mentioned this film and this location. And he just, his response to me was, let's do it. A couple of weeks later, we were in, we were in New York and uh, meeting with the, the McCullers estate and getting the rights to the, uh, to, to the story. And here we are. I guess in some ways I was sort of the boots on the ground producer here in, in the Berkshires. Diane Perlman came and got involved with us as a, another producer and we began to pull together little by little a crew. And the first person I introduced Karen to was our director of photography, Rick Sands. Uh, I've known him for 25 years. He's done all kinds of shooting around the world, but he lives here. Uh, she asked me if I'd be interested in shooting this and I was thrilled and even more thrilled after I read the script. And when Karen said that she might want to, she was shooting a period piece, this was 1947, and it might be black and white, there was really only one person that I thought of. The story revolves around a conversation. And the conversation is so, so interesting 
uh, just like composition, you're framing out everything you don't want to see. And uh, color also, to me, becomes a distraction. It was Karen's choice. I felt to make the film in black and white gave us a kind of place to sit in time. So Rick came on at board, and then one of my oldest and dearest friends in, in the world is a wonderful production designer, and her name is Christy Zia. Working on a period film is difficult always because very little can actually be used that you see. So it's about figuring out what you can keep and what you have to change. She transformed the Silverbrook into this 1947 cafe that looks so beautiful on film. I mean, it was an extraordinary crew of people that came together to make this happen. And Diane had a huge impact on that, bringing that group of people together. Everybody is there because in their hearts they want to be there. And that's nice. You know, that's, that's kind of what indie filmmaking is. You know, whatever it takes to get to the end result. And I feel like the beauty of the story and the way it affected people when they read it, they just wanted to be a part of the telling of this story. So um, I ch chose my material well. <laughs> Karen has an extraordinary, innate idea of what it's like to be a director, I think. She has an incredible facility with actors because she is one herself. Karen has been a fan of Jeffrey for a long, long, long time. I think he is a master of the craft of acting, the art of acting. And I think for as long as I have imagined wanting to work on this particular story, I've always imagined wanting him to play this role. She said, would you take a look at this? I said, you betcha. Yeah. And I took a look at it and said, oh God, why not? This is lovely. So it was, yeah, it was easy. James McMenamin is an actor that I met maybe four or five years ago. I just have the most fun with him and he's such a wonderful chameleon of an actor. And I, I knew that this character, which is somewhat one-dimensionally written on the page, would develop a wonderful complexity in his hands. She will let an actor find their story. She'll let an actor find a path, let an actor find a character. But she's also, she will, will pick at, at the specific in a really good way. She won't, she won't let anything slide by. And she's interested in the minutia and the storyline of, of every single character in the process. We're just going to give you a little continuity on the newspaper, James, because we might have to intercut with what we were doing yesterday. When they showed up for rehearsal, and I was standing there and looking at Jeff and looking at James, and then we have to add Jackson into this mix. We auditioned a number of young actors. And Jackson came along, and about 10 seconds into the audition, I, in my heart, I said, oh. There we go, that's the one. I was really nervous because I had never worked on a film before, but once I got in there, um, Jeff was really nice and I knew Karen a little bit before and Karen was really nice. He's a natural actor. His timing is extraordinary. I certainly enjoyed working with him and James, but Jeff has like the lion's share. He, Jeff tells the story and Jeff blew everybody's minds. He's just magical. That's kind of the word I would use for all of them. They created this magical place in time. Hey, Margaret. Then Charlie, take one. Ready and action. We also discover things by letting the camera roll and the scene continue, even though it was supposed to have been a cut. There were two or three times at least that we kept rolling the camera and magic happened. And we're all looking at each other. This is amazing. Karen has a wonderful combination of being collaborative, but also uh, she knows what she wants and she's going to try and get it. But if in the process she sees something that would also work or that she maybe even likes better, that works too. One special thing about the, the shoot is we try to get as much crew local as possible. This was a Berkshire production from Soup to Nuts. And that was very exciting. And we got a lot of support from the town of Sandusfield. People are so cooperative and so friendly, and they really want to help. They want filmmaking to be here, and you sense that. 
even a small film like this makes a huge economic impact, but also it shows off the Berkshires. It's an amazing place to live and work and make movies, and so we hope that this film sort of spotlights that. I think watching Karen evolve into a film director has been a wonderful experience. My hopes for this project are, are that at the end, uh, Karen has an enormous smile on her face and a great feeling of satisfaction that she has brought to life this story that has meant so much to her for many, many years. I would love to see this little story and this film get as much exposure as it can because I just find it so beautiful. We also want to get sort of Carson McCullers back out there as a writer to the educational sector so that her writings don't go unnoticed or buried in the next century. Whether that's in elementary schools or high schools or universities or in whatever educational piece, you know, we can get involved with. The Carson McCullers Center has been a huge supporter of this project and Karen is going to Georgia to speak with the film as well as I guess Carson had it pretty large international following. So Karen's been invited to go to Rome to screen the film as well, and that's a huge honor. I think that this film will take us on its own journey, <laughs> you know? I don't really see it necessarily being about us figuring out what we want to do with the film, but I feel like the film will, like, tell us where it wants to go and, and we'll follow it as it sort of finds its way. So I'm just along for the ride. <laughs>
mimicking her, the vibrations of her vocal cords. And, um, and then the blindness was very much a challenge, but I, I, I learned how to basically, you know, there's energy in our eyes, you know, and we focus our eyes on different things. And I learned how to take that energy and send it backwards instead of forwards. Mm -hmm. So when I was actually working with that. I had a real sense of being blind, of not being able to see because I just wasn't allowing my eyes to focus outwardly. They were focusing back backwards. And, you know, it was, it was fascinating. I, I loved it. I loved doing that play so much. We did it in four different theaters on our way to Broadway. And uh, we were at the Spoleto Festival in Charleston, which was very special at the Dock Street Theater. At the, we did it at the Actors Studio and we did it at the Kennedy Center in Washington, which was great. Um, and I got to work with the wonderful Jane Alexander and the exquisite Arthur Penn, who became really one of my mentors as a director, particularly in the theater more so than, than film. But, but um, it, was, it, was, it was great. It was great. It, it, really, it really shaped uh, directions I wanted to go in in terms of working in the theater. Well. We look forward to seeing you more in the theater uh, and other and other uh, projects that you're working on. What's next for you, Karen? Well, I want to direct a version of Uncle Vanya, and I want to use the same cast that I used. Uh, I did a John Patrick Shanley play called Outside Mullingar, um, which was uh, last last summer, and I had just my dream cast, an exquisite cast. Uh, two of the actors of which are in A Tree Rock a Cloud, uh, Jeffrey uh, DeMunn and, and James McMenamin. And um, uh, so I'm, I'm looking to do that. Uh, a new, it's a new translation of, of Uncle Vanya. And then there's two films, both of which shoot predominantly in London that I was gonna be doing this spring, summer, fall um, that obviously got postponed <laughs> because there's absolutely nothing happening. But um, I think both of those are gonna boot back up at some point. So when they, when they do, I will, I will uh, jump back, back in there. And then, and then other than that, I've just been working, working. I have this little store, Karen Allen Fiber Arts in Great Barrington, and I've been doing major CPR on that, trying to save its life. Um, which is not easy in this, in this COVID period that we're going through. Um, you know, we were closed for four months and, and now we're open, but you know, I can't say people are just storming the gates, uh, trying to buy clothing that they have nowhere to wear. Um, but um, Zoom is helping, people do need tops. <laughs> But we'll see. We'll see if the store can survive. I'm doing everything I can to, to try to make that happen. It's such a beautiful shop and your work is so beautiful. I wanted to make sure that that was mentioned, of course, that you're a fiber artist as well as an actor and a director. Um, and I, I can put the link to uh, the fiber art, just, uh, fiber art shop here so people can see. Um, and we'll send out the links afterwards in an email too, because I know it's hard to collect them all from chat. Um, did you uh, did you want to follow up, Renee, with another question, or do you want me to? Well, thank you. First of all, uh, yes, I have one last question. Everyone has been asking if there might be another Indiana Jones film on the horizon, and perhaps uh, you might be able to talk about that or well, not. There is going to be another one on the horizon. Um, you know, I, how, how much I can talk about it, I'm not sure. I have not. You know, there's still, as far as I know, tinkering with the script. Um, we are, I, you know, I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't seen the script. So um, I'm pretty sure I'm in it. Um, but, and, and Harrison, but other than that, I have absolutely no idea who, who else might be involved. And, um, you know, I think it, it was, it was set to start shooting sometime soon now, but of course it's been postponed. So when it, you know, when it will actually happen is, is anybody's guess at this point, I guess. Well, I want to Thank you very, very much for a lovely conversation this morning. Uh, yeah, it's been sorry, it was delightful so you interrupted by Mass Electric. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Well, we managed. And Diane, <laughs> thank you very much. It's always great to see you as well. And I wish you both the very best uh, in all of your endeavors coming up. And uh, uh, thank you so much for being with Ollie today. I'm going to turn it over to Megan. I know there are lots of questions. Hope to see you soon. Okay. All right. Thanks. And he's not disappearing. He's just thinking. Um, I have with a question here from Linda Colvin. She says, um, hi, Karen. I think I saw you in a production of Shakespeare and Company at the Mount a number of years ago. Um, am I mistaken? Uh, or is, uh, she says it's not mentioned in your Wikipedia info. Oh, well, what is Wikipedia? I mean, there's so, there are so many things in Wikipedia. I'm like, where did that come from? There are so many inaccuracies in Wikipedia, and that, that's just stuff they do put in. What they leave out, I have no idea. But, but uh, no, I was. I did As You Like It. I'm going to guess and say it was about the summer of 88, maybe. And... Um, uh, yeah, I had a wonderful time. It was when it was still at the Mount and it was the outdoor theater and uh, it was it was a great deal of fun. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. So she wasn't she wasn't imagining things. <laughs> no. <laughs> wonderful. Let's see. Um, uh, I want to just mention that Sarah um, Gelbert First said, Renee is a true professional, underscoring that no matter what, the show must go on, and it did. So uh, thank you, Renee. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, thank you Karen. That's just how we roll in the Berkshires. Um, and she also said uh, that the trailer was absolutely wonderful and that it drew her to plan to watch it. So she oh, really great. appreciated great. that. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And um, Deb Cole Duffy was really excited to hear about the, um, the planned, uh, the Berkshire Film Institute, uh, the Kemble, um, and she would love to hear actually more about it and um, says it's a boon in so many ways and thanks you. Um, has this been covered in the press or has it been sort of quiet so far? Um, well, we did get our first grant from the Mass Cultural Council. Uh, we're doing a feasibility study to see what are the first revenue streams? So we're looking to match that 30,000 now. So it came out, those grants were announced in the paper. Um, there were actually two of us that, that uh, won the uh, RFP. One is for some workforce housing, which hasn't solidified, so they haven't made a formal announcement. But uh, once the grant was in the paper, yes. Uh, you know, So it's, it's out in the world. And if anyone um, would like to get involved, you know, either contact me through our website or not. Um, I think what's amazing during this time is the collaborations between the nonprofits for them to s survive. You know, as Renee mentioned, Biff is showing films both at Simon's Rock and at Shakespeare and Company and the Mahewees involved. And we just partnered with Great Barrington Public Theater to put the, some of their short plays on. Video. So I think it's a really exciting time for the nonprofit world in the Berkshires to collaborate to make sure that our arts stay um, prominent and relevant during this time. Absolutely, and I think that, uh, you know, because the Berkshires are sort of isolated and we're, you know, not very big, we have a really strong tradition of adaptation and collaboration. And I know the Massachusetts Cultural Council always, always points to the Berkshires as an example of, you know, playing well together and collaborating and stuff. And part of it is, you know, we all know each other, we see each other in Guidos and so forth. So um, I think that is one of the benefits of a smaller, uh, more rural community. Um, and it certainly, it just shows up so beautifully in, in Karen's film you know, that really draws upon the best of the Berkshires. And I have to say, I just love that young actor's ears. Ah, oh, they're the best, <laughs> aren't they? <laughs> they are so darn cute. <laughs> yeah, he's a beautiful, beautiful young, well, he's now I know. 17, I, I think. I, I haven't seen him, but last time I saw him, he was about a foot taller. And I know. We, we all I, think of him as Jackson in the film, but you know. Sure, everything's always getting younger, he's getting older, you know. But yeah. So, yep. So Deb writes, I can't wait to view the film, A Tree or Rock of Cloud. The passion of the story and filmmaking in the Berkshires was awesome. Can you remind us how we might be able to access this film? Or is it accessible right now? Not right now, but we're, we're looking to get it onto Amazon so that you can. 
and we are going to uh, uh, distribute with Canopy, but but that would be you'd you'd go through kind of an educational resource in that in that instance. But uh, I think maybe the thing to do is to wait until it's on Amazon, and then you'd be able to see it, which sure. we're, we're working on at the moment. Yeah. I think maybe we'll do a little press release locally when that happens so people know because there were a lot of people that both contributed time and resources to the film. So I think our community would really know. So as soon as we do that, maybe Karen will put it out in a press release so, or and social media so people will know. Great. Have you thought about doing it as a drive-in? Oh, uh, well, short, short films, you'd have to put it together with a group of short films. Um, yeah, or a uh, talk. Yeah, or a talk, yeah. I've done, we've done, Diane and I together have done, we did it at the Monterey uh, uh, Community Center. We did it at the Sandusfield Community Center. Um, you know, where, you know, if somebody wants to invite us to come and show it someplace, if they have a venue, we're, you know, we're always, we, we always very much enjoy sharing it with people. So somebody has a little film venue, they could, you know, set it up for us to come and show it and give a talk, that'd be, fun. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll put that out in the universe. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> My board president said, says this is the year of experiments. Yeah. So yeah. trying new things. So uh, Francis asked, Karen, what do you know about the wave of actresses and actors that came out of Australia in recent years? Are there any on the horizon? That's a very interesting question. Um, well, obviously, Kate Blanchett is one of my all-time favorite actresses. I think she's just extraordinary, both in the theater and in film. Um, there is a young actress, and I don't know if I'm going to remember her name right now, who I felt, I felt like I sort of discovered her. I'm sure I didn't discover her, but I mean, I saw her in a film at a film festival, and she just, she just blew me away. And... I may not even be able to remember the name of the film right now. So this is, of course, totally unhelpful. But, you know, I mean, I think Australia has an extraordinary, you know, you know, so many actors that we know and love already. And I'm sure that that's not going to change. They have, a, I think, a very strong tradition of having wonderful acting uh, institutions, people, places where people go to study acting. And then they have an extraordinary theater theater world there. Um, so and and film industry, which which seems to you know it's had its it's had its days where you know there were periods where there were just tons of Australian films that we were seeing all the time. Um, uh, and so maybe their their film industry has its little ups and downs or peaks and valleys, as as does every every country's. But um, uh, no, I'm sure I'm I'm struggling right now to think of this beautiful young woman's name. She was actually in a Steven Spielberg film that I did not see, which is the, it was the very futuristic one about, I think it's the whole thing is inside of a game. Anyway, mm. she was, I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. Oh, oh, I know which one you mean, but I can't think of it either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't, I can't think of the name of it, but she, she was, she was in it and, and uh, uh, just trying to make any connection to her, I can because at first I was saying we all have pandemic brain, but now I just call it 2020 brain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so I, I have a question. Karen, you've worked with a number of directors. What was it about Steven Spielberg that you particularly enjoyed? You know, he's, he's somebody who does an enormous amount of preparation. So he knows exactly you know, you feel he knows exactly the film that he wants to make, and he has a very clear sense of what it's going to look like and how he's going to shoot it. And yet, there's something about him that is also very spontaneous and very, uh, you know, he can he can get very excited about something he wasn't expecting to happen and go off on other little tangents. And I think that that's unusual, uh, you know, for somebody to have both of those qualities. Um, uh, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of people who are very prepared and I've worked with a lot of people who are very spontaneous. But for somebody to, you know, to have both of those as, as a strong suit, I think is unusual. And um, 
you know, I mean, if you look at his career, you know, it, it's just extraordinary. The, the, the different kinds of films he has pursued and wanted to make. And, um, you know, I think he has a very, very diverse, but very, very uh, also singular voice um, in, in, the film, in the film world. And he likes everything from just pure entertainment, pure, he's a real, he's a movie fan. And then he's also a, a master, you know, he's, he's, it's an interesting combination. You know, I, I hope you won't mind if I tell you a quick, wonderful story. Uh, John Williams was uh, the guest at uh, Talks and Walks at Tanglewood, and he was speaking about his relationship with Steven Spielberg during Schindler's List. And of mm. course, he created the extraordinary score to Schindler's List. And so Steven and John were talking and uh, um, John saw, I believe, what are called the galleys with, without sound. Uh, and um, he said, you know, I, I really think, Stephen, that you need a better composer than I. This is an extraordinary film, and you just need a better composer than I to do the score. And Steven Spielberg looked at John Williams and said, yes, I agree with you, but they're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. Well, he came up with an extraordinary score, so I think he was underestimating himself. <laughs> well, again, I really loved uh, the composer's score to A Tree, A Rock, and A Cloud. It was mm -hmm. just hauntingly beautiful and uh, uh, look, look forward to uh, us uh, seeing the film again uh, and again. It, it's really wonderful. He's a lo local composer, music teacher. He's got his own little recording studio here in the Berkshires and just a lovely, lovely man, Mark Kelso. He was my son's piano teacher, which oh. I got to know his music so well. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Nice. So uh, Mike in the um, audience says, uh, Film Columbia would definitely consider showing a film like this. Uh, the Film Festival in Columbia County. I don't know if they're holding it this year though. Normally it's in October. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember if we showed it Film Columbia, mm -hmm. Dream Like a Cloud. We know that festival very well. I, 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 and, go to it. <laughs> yeah. huh? I, don't, I go to it, but I don't know if, do they do shorts? I'm not sure if, I'm not sure why we didn't, or if, I'll have to look back and see if we showed it. We showed it at quite a few, so I'll take a sure, look. Yeah. And if not, and we can Mike go. says yes, they do shorts, so, so it's so, possible. I I, I'm sure we would have submitted it and we might have gotten turned down. I don't know. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> film, um, and, and just to mention, you know, the film is, you know, 29 minutes, which is still a short, but it was interesting put it at, putting it out into the world because people get drawn into this film. It has a definite feel to it. And you know, places like Sundance are having 14,000 uh, submissions now. And it was interesting for us because we felt like some places didn't actually really look at enough of it. You know, they may have only looked at the first 30 seconds. And um, it's interesting in the film festival world now, you know, they're looking, oh, well, do I want a half hour film or I can show three 10 minute films. But, you know, what I appreciated about working with Karen was this was her vision. This is how this film feels. And people that see it are really transformed. You know, it did, it, you know, it did show here at BIF and um, it, it's just an extraordinary film. So, um, but it, it really sort of takes you back in time. And uh, we did have a great festival run and uh, people just love that, I guess, um, the tone of the film is very different from what's out there. And it's just beautiful and extraordinary. So I can't wait till you do your next one here. Yeah. I'm working on it, I'm working on it. <laughs> So uh, Jenny in the audience says, I'm thinking an Ollie course on local film or film shorts would be a great idea, just saying. And I was thinking the same thing. Uh, we actually, Ollie is offering, you know, again, experiments, experiment, the year of experiments, we have a film class that um, that is curated by an Ollie member who I believe is here with us today, Howie Arkins. 
And uh, so we decided to try it on Zoom, which was a huge experiment, um, but it has been uh, very successful. The video quality is not certainly not going to be as good as on the screen, um, or but it's but people are still you know getting grossed in it, and um, and then are you know enjoy talking about it afterwards. So uh, we're actually working on a, uh, a documentary film series for the uh, winter semester. Um, uh, that would also be on Zoom. Our class, um, Ollie, all of our programming has moved online since March, and uh, the next, the fall and winter semester will be fully online as well. So we're kind of prepared for the long haul with that. And um, even when it becomes feasible to have in-person classes again, a number of our members have said they really enjoy taking classes online and would like to continue to do that afterwards. So, you know, it's a it's interesting, you know, especially when you have someone, a member in Beckett, and they have to drive to Williamstown to a class. They're like, I like this online thing. <laughs> I can watch in my pajamas. I can turn the sound up or down, and I always have a front row seat. So, well, it's great to broaden, be able to broaden your audience that way. Um, you know, yes, I, we've had members join from Canada and Texas, so yeah. it's broadened. And we've also had instructors from. Um, teach a class from Florida, from Pennsylvania. So it's it has been. Uh, you know, we're we're always looking for those silver linings. Well, Megan, it's inter I mean, years ago, I think I taught a class on the history of visual effects here, or the visual effects industry. But to your point about filmmakers, there are a lot of filmmakers here that I'm sure would love to talk. Whether it's you know, of course, Karen, but Diego Angar Angaro did Bob in the Trees as a short, then it became a feature, and Ben Hillman has shot you know, several films here. So, you know, there are a lot of filmmakers that I'm sure would be interested in participating about why they're here, the freedom mm -hmm. of shooting here, as opposed to, you know, there are a lot of us that decided not to go back. I mean, I came to work with Doug Trumbull in 92 and just forgot to go back to New York or decided that this was a better <laughs> quality of life. And so I think, you know, um, we're finding more and more that filmmaking is becoming very community based. And there are people that are doing films here that are going out into the world. So be happy to help curate that if you would like. Great, thank you. And was it Rick Sands that did the documentary about the Navajo girls basketball team? Okay. Does that ring a bell? No. Uh, did he shoot? Or someone, someone else who lives in Pittsfield actually, maybe. Maybe. Sorry. 2020 I, brain. No, it's okay. <laughs> I try and know everything, but I think there's a little too much in mind at the moment. But uh, <laughs> uh, I know Rick mostly as a as a shooter, as a director of photography. So I don't know he he may have. I know he did shoot a feature out in the Midwest. So you know a lot of filmmakers go away and come back here, but they really do want to film here. And if I can add, Renee, we forgot the name of the movie where Bedford Hall was in. It's Cider House Rules. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, you know, it comes a little bit. <laughs> that's right. That's another course, just the feature films that have been filmed in the Berkshires. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Absolutely. I, I really um, uh, appreciate the fact that uh, you both have chosen the Berkshires as your home. Uh, and we talked a little bit about the quality of life, of living here, and the creativity, and uh, just the surprises uh, as you turn every which direction there's always uh someone lurking who's done something extraordinary and and uh, i love the surprises of living here in the berkshires and thank you very very much both of you for uh doing this today for us we've really appreciated it my pleasure so sorry i, I vanished there for a while but uh so did i <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I, uh, yeah. No, I jumped in my car. I drove down the road and I, I found like a, a group of five uh, mass electric guys up in the trees with their chains. <laughs> I said, did you deliberately shut down the electricity? Yeah. Oh, yes. The anti I thought it had to do with the question that I asked you and I said, oh, I've really antagonized her now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I rely on Google as my brain extension and I just double checked and so the, the, the Navajo Girls basketball team movie is called Rocks with Wings and it was directed by Rick Derby who uh, lives here in Pittsfield. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. No, I do know Rick Derby. Rick yes. Rick, Rick, Rick Derby and Rick Sands. Okay, it's all right. So okay. I didn't want to look down and Google it myself, but <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I just have to say, like, even when I ran Mass Illusion, the visual effects house in the 90s, um, 
you know, not being in LA or New York, like when we had to solve a problem, like literally in the middle of Judge Dredd, they were like, the movie's boring. We have to put Stallone on a flying motorcycle. And I was like, what? <laughs> luckily we had built the models big enough that we could turn them around and make them different parts of the city. But you know, the group of guys that we had, the mechanical engineers had worked with Doug Trumbull on designing motion bases. And they were like, we'll be right back. We're going on a hike. And they disappeared for like two hours. And they came back and they sat at the table and said, you know, we built the motion bases. We know how to put Stallone on a motion base. And we'll, we built this rig that we ended up taking to Shepard and Studios of him and Rob Schneider on, on a motion based motorcycle flying through the city. So, you know, when, the, when we talk about magic in the Berkshires, like there's no one looking over our shoulders. Like we're, when we're here, there's just been incredible technology, at least in the visual effects world that was developed here because people can get outside and be in nature and think and be, create. And um, it's one of the reasons I didn't go back to New York is I think there's just some incredible filmmaking that's happening here and a creative energy. And so we're hoping to continue that in the film industry here. I love that. Access to big mind in the Berkshires. Go out and take a hike <laughs> when you're confronted with a challenge. Well, thank you all so much. This has been wonderful. And sometimes the unexpected just makes things even more interesting. <laughs> or it oh, almost it always does. does. Actually. So uh, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Renee Rhoda, especially. And uh, if you have any last words, Renee or Karen or Diane, please feel free. Well, it's a pleasure. It always is, even with the, um, un the additional excitements that we had today. <laughs> and I hope you will all join me next Thursday for our final session with conductor Stefan Deneb from Sweden. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Renee. And thank you, Megan. And thank you, Diane. And uh, it was fun. My friends, it was really fun. This was great fun. So thank you for having me and including us in your, um, in your series, Renee. It's really exciting. It's our pleasure. Enjoy this beautiful Berkshire's day. Okay. It is <laughs> All right. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.